Well, I never took it. I just, I, just, I can't relate. I think it was on the bar, and I'm pretty sure, like, when you guys take uh, the bar review class, um, they, they'll give you this um, uh, this breakdown of how often different topics are tested. And you're supposed to um, uh, adjust the amount of time you study uh, based on the frequency uh, a, t a topic is tested. And as I recall, and, and I can check this later, I'm sure, that tax was like the least frequently tested topic. And I remember the, the, uh, the bar review uh, uh, professor said, uh, give a half day for tax and you'll be good. <laughs> so look, I, I, I know, I know you guys, you guys hate me. Um, and I know it's not even on the bar exam. I, we had this debate a couple of years ago about whether to make tax a non-required class. I think I told you I voted to make it non-required. I lost. So it, it's there. Uh, it is useful in limited regard. It's actually – the reason why tax I think is useful is not because it's actually tax, uh, but because it teaches you how to use a code. Uh, and most law you'll ever do is actually code-based. It's not common law-based. There's very little common law stuff that actually matters for most attorneys. Code matters a lot. So – I think the, the value of the tax class is actually learning to use administrative law and learn use codes. Uh, but uh, anyway, sorry, not, not my call. I don't, some things I control, some things I don't. All right, we have, I think 56 here. I think we got a plurality. Uh, I've went to ready to start. Uh, if you're not checked into the attendance, please do that now. All right, uh, questions before we get started. All right, I got poll questions today. I got lots of them, and I want to use these poll questions to try to um, uh, reinforce your understanding of the various tiers of scrutiny that we've discussed so far. Uh, so here, let me put the link to the class chat in the in the chat box. Okay, I think I have at least six or seven questions. I'll go through as many of them as I can. Now let's try and do these one after the other. All right, and I'm gonna do a rapid fire. So these will be quick. All right, uh, polling software loading. Okay, question number one, short answer. Race is a blank classification. Race is a blank classification. Okay, another 10 seconds. Okay. I'm gonna stop it. Three, two, one. Okay. Question number two Sex is a blank classification. Sex is a blank classification. All right, another 10 seconds. Three, two, one, good. Question number three. Age is a blank classification. Age is a blank classification. Good. Another five more seconds. Five, four, three. No. Okay, done. All right, good. I asked you last class to get these committed to memory because you have to you have to just know these things cold. There's not. Um, a lot that I make you guys memorize, but this is one of the things which I think is very important to just have in your head and uh, to know cold. All right. So number one, race is a suspect classification. Um, some of you put tier one, which is not correct. Some of you put strict scrutiny, which is not correct. 
we're talking about the classification and the answer is suspect. Number two, sex is a quasi-suspect classification. Quasi-suspect classification. Some of you put tier two or intermediate. That's not correct. We're asking about the classification, right? With an equal protection question, the first step, the first thing you have to do is identify what's the classification. Question number three, Age is a non-suspect classification. That's correct. Again, some of you put tier three, some of you put rational basis. That's not correct. We're asking about the classification. All right, any question of those three, that should, this should just be simple review. Uh, any question of those three uh, questions? All right. So the first step we ask ourselves is what's a classification? And then we have to consider the means and scrutiny, right? Where we consider what is the government doing and what are they trying to achieve? So let's look at question number four, please. Question number four is also a short answer. In order to impose a suspect classification, the state must demonstrate a blank interest. And, and again, when I say suspect classification, that means they're discriminating the basis of race. They're separating people on the basis of their race. What kind of interest must the state advance? Okay, another 10 more seconds. Okay. If you're good, stop it here. Good, the answer here is compelling, okay? A compelling governmental interest. And most of you got this right, very good. Okay. Um, what is a compelling governmental interest? The court really hasn't told us that much. Um, they've said certain things are, uh, National security we know is compelling and maybe a few others, but we don't have like a, you know, a list of what's compelling. And I'm not sure the courts want to be in the business of deciding what is and is not compelling. Okay. All right. Are there any questions so far? Now I want to, uh, let's jump to actually number six. I'll come back to number five later. Actually, let me just, I'll reorient them so you know it's will get screwed up. This becomes question five, that becomes question six. I'm calling it audible on the fly. Okay, let's try question number five. Question number five. In order to impose a suspect classification, the state must use blank means. Fill in the blank, please. In order to impose a suspect classification, the state must use blank means. Okay, another 10 seconds. The answer here is narrowly tailored, which I think most of you got right. People spell narrowly different ways, but I think most of you are in the ballpark. Okay. Narrowly tailored. Okay. What does narrowly tailored mean? If you're going to use race to accomplish some compelling interest, you have to use race in the most narrow way possible, right? You don't use race in a, a sloppy way, right? You have to be very careful how you use race, all right? So now let me ask you two questions about affirmative action, which was in your reading. We didn't, we didn't get to it last class, but uh, I think you should be able to answer these questions as well. So question number six.
what is the compelling interest to support race-based affirmative action? Oh, shoot. I'm sorry. I hate to stop button. I'm sorry. That one got messed up. My mistake. I'll start it again. I, I apologize. Um, try it again. Question six. What is the compelling interest to support race-based affirmative action? I'm asking, uh, oh, Kevin's asking a question. Um, uh, let's stick with the case for now. Maybe we'll get to your own opinion later. I, I, I want to at least try and keep the, the poll question at least somewhat um, grounded in our reading. Or another 10 seconds. All right, I'll stop it there. Let me do the next question and we'll come back to this one in a bit. So here's what I'm calling question seven. This question's a little bit harder. What are the narrowly tailored means to achieve a valid race-based affirmative action program? What are the narrowly tailored means to achieve a race-based affirmative action program? Yeah, this one's harder. All right, maybe another 30 seconds. This one's like a little bit trickier. Okay. 10 more seconds, I'll stop it. All right, I'll stop it here. Um, all right. who is, um, who is next in the queue? Oh, Shawnee. Okay. I'm all the, I'm at Z. Okay. I'm all the way at the bottom, bottom, bottom. Okay. I'll go back up to A in a second. All right, Shawnee. So let me ask you, uh, the first question that we posed, right? What is the compelling interest, um, to support race-based affirmative action? Um, the benefits that are stemming from educational diversity. What does that mean? So you're getting like a diverse group of people and their cultures and ideas in an educational space and they're meshing together. And why is that interest compelling? Um, I guess because it's some, it's like, a, I guess like it's like a melting pot idea where Different people are coming together and they are they're contributing to what otherwise would be just one view or opinion or approach. Okay. All right. Uh, Hisela, I think come back up to the top to you, letter A. Why is that interest, uh, the educational benefits that flow from diversity, Hisela, why is that interest compelling? Uh, because I think schools are trying to promote that educational benefit for students too. Like for it's better for a school to have like um, I guess a school is known for like their edu uh, their education, so they're wanting students that um, that can benefit to like what they're trying to achieve. Okay, but the word here is compelling. I think we agree that maybe it's important and it's you know it helps schools with teaching. But what does compelling mean? Um, that like, they have, like, it's necessary, like, it, that they need it, compelling. What, what do you mean they need it? I think you're on the right track. Just give me a little bit more. What does it mean they need it? Um, in order to achieve, 
their like goal, like their end, I guess, um, they need to. Well, this is the goal. The, the goal is these benefits. I'm asking why is why is this benefit these goals compelling? Um, because you just. Um, what does compelling mean? Just let's start the word compelling. Um, compelling is just like that. You, it's like you need. Uh, like essential, maybe. Yeah, essential. Like, like you necessary. Like, could you have a university without? These benefits that flow from diversity? Would it exist? Could you do it? Um, I guess so, yeah. So what's compelling mean? Um, that it's just so strong, I guess, that looks... Yeah, yeah. Okay, hold on. Rachel, are you here, Rachel? Rachel? No, oh, Rachel. Melissa, are you here? Hey, I'm here. Lisa, what does compelling mean in your mind? Um, when I think of compelling, I think of like it's like substantially important that it be substantially important. It, uh, what's the last part you said? Substantially important what? To be implemented, I guess, for the case. Could you have a university without it if it's essential or compelling? Um, I guess like no. Okay. All right. So let, let, let me ask you a follow-up question, Alyssa. Um, if the compelling interest for affirmative action is these certain benefits that flow from uh, having a diverse classroom, these educational benefits, mm -hmm. could, this, could, could the government say, you know what, we want to just have uh, the percentages uh in our classroom, reflect the percentage of society. So let's say, let's say a certain state has, you know, thirty percent African American, making up twenty percent Hispanic and fifty percent white. I'm just making up numbers. That's more than a hundred, I think, actually. Right? Can they say, you know, we're just going to balance our, our our classroom so it reflects society at large? Would that serve the interest that's stated? Um, maybe like a the state's interest but not like an overall interest. Well, well hold on again. What's the interest for affirmative action? Just let's say it up more time. The interest for affirmative action? Right. What's the state interest that we're talking about here? Like the benefits of educational diversity? Right. So the educational benefits from diversity, right? So I guess you would be getting the benefits. Well, how do we know that mirroring the percentages of state demographics would yield educational benefits? If you, I guess it would have to be like a, you'd have to decide what the standard of like educational diversity would be. Ooh, Joseph, you here? Yes. Joseph, if we just balance the classroom such that, um, you know, whatever the state percentage is for African-American students, that's what we add. And whatever this respect since we add, does that accomplish our interest of educational benefits from diversity? Uh, I would say no because you can't go strictly off of the numbers. Why not? Percentages. Why, why, why can't you go strictly off the numbers? Because race can only play like a, uh, a as a plus. In well, what are you? For, well, are you still talking about what the state interest is? Or what, what are you talking about now? Or, or, okay, well, I kind of got off the interest. So I guess no, it, you're allowed. You're allowed. You're, you're on the right track. What are you doing now? You're saying it's it's not. It, it doesn't really accomplish the goal. What, what do you? What do you? What fact are you thinking about now with our analysis? Um, I was thinking more about like the narrowly. Tailored. Yes, the fit, right? This is what's called the fit, narrow tailoring. So explain to me how this works, right? If I again, I think this was my exam question a year or two ago in, in a variant form. If we just say that, you know, say 30% of the state is African-American, that way we admit 30% of our student body are African-American. Is that a valid means to accomplish the end of educational diversity? No. Why? Um, again, because it only takes into account race and uh, 
But explain, you said before it's not narrowly tailored. Explain to me why that policy is not narrowly tailored. Because they didn't, like you wouldn't be trying to find a more, uh, like there was no good faith effort to find a more like race neutral. A race neutral way of doing what? The, to get your desired. Yes. Okay. Percent. There it is. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you, Joseph. I think the uh, demos was looking for, right? So. I'm using this hypothetical to illustrate the narrow tailoring concept, which I agree is not an intuitive concept. The court has said that the educational benefits that flow from diverse classrooms is a compelling interest. Okay, fine. That means you can use racial preferences in order to achieve that goal, but you can only use the racial preferences in a narrowly tailored fashion. Right. In other words, you have to use race as little as possible. Having a straight up quota, so to speak, where it says 30 percent of the class is African-American, whatever it happens to be. Um, the court has said it's not narrowly tailored. You're using race in too far of a fashion. Maybe you can achieve those benefits with 15 percent of African-American students. Maybe you can use it with 10 percent. Right. Maybe, maybe you need 30. Right. Maybe, in fact, the right number is 30, whatever the number happens to be. But the key is you have to show that you're using race not to simply achieve some sort of statistical number, but you're using race in order to achieve the benefits of diversity from education, right? You're trying to achieve it. So what the courts have said is that when you use affirmative action, you always have to have in mind what kind of benefits are you gaining? Right. Um, this came up in the Fisher litigation, the UT litigation we'll talk about later. Um, one of the proposals is why don't you just use socioeconomic status uh, instead of race, right? Just admit poor people. And, and, and invariably, that would probably increase minority numbers. And the university came back and said, well, we don't just want poor black people. We want rich black people as well, because that's a different standard. They said, we want the, what was the examples they gave? We want the, the child of the wealthy African-American doctor in Dallas going to our school, not just the poor people in Dallas. So when you have these cases, right, at least on paper, the school must demonstrate that their use of race in admissions is designed to achieve the benefits of diversity, right? Um, yeah, Macy, you're right, Halitas, right? They're not saying that a person should be admitted because uh, of some other factors. They're saying that when, I'm in, when a minority student is admitted under a racial preference program, they're being admitted because of what they can bring to the table to create benefits. And that's a, it's, it's a bit of not what people think, right? Um, who's next? Uh, uh, Jack, you here? Yes, sir, I am. Jack, so before you came to law school, at least before you came to my class, if I just asked you, just, you know, Jack, what's the reason why we have affirmative action? What would you have probably told me? You know, what's, the, what's the state's interest, you know, if I just asked you last year before you took my class, right? What, what would you have said? Um, to get, to make decisions, to uh, get things done, I guess. Yeah, be a little more specific. Um, for, to create more diversity. Why? Why was it important to create more diversity? That's, that's um, the question I'm asking you. Yes, admitting more minority students would have a more diverse class. That's true. But the question is more precise. Why was a state university trying to achieve more diversity? Um, to create more, um, equality or to gain different insights, uh, or different opinions that people of different backgrounds may have and can contribute. So you, you're saying that the educational benefits is the is the reason they're doing this. Well, not just necessarily uh, educational, because I think they can affect other things outside of education. Well, Jack, let me ask the question a little differently, maybe. Um, you know, we just studied in this class, you know, the period leading up to the Civil War, right? 
the Reconstruction era, you know, you have Brown and the desegregation cases, you have Loving, you know, you have this entire long history, you know, in this country of, of racial prejudice. Long, 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 long history. Why do you think a lot of the schools started to use these policies back in the 70s when they started really to get going? To, to keep schools segregated? No, no, this is not working. Uh, 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 Lady, who's next? Uh, Lady, you're next. Lady, if I just asked you, you know, last year before you've been a law student, why did schools have why did schools start affirmative action? What would you probably have told me? Um, partly in response to a requirement to, and also to create opportunities for historically discriminated against minorities. Ah, okay. I think now we're on the right track, right? What do you mean create opportunities for historically discriminated minorities? Just, just, just develop that a little bit more. Because we had been going through our country's evolution of discriminating against excluding um, particularly blacks in trying to correct that we want to um, we want to affirmatively to use the word create opportunities and make sure that there is you know give them give them a chance the schools are still going to have a standard um, as far as academic performance but we need to make sure we're including all groups ah, okay so Lainey says that this, these sort of racial preferences were designed to uh, make up for, correct, I think was the word you used, for past injustices, right? Yes. Lady, did it, did it matter if the university itself was involved in these sorts of acts? You know, for example, I'll take the University of Michigan, for example. This was not a slaveholding state. This was not the Confederacy. This was not a, uh, you know, this was not a Jim Crow state. It was, it was it's based in Canada, right? You know, it's, it's, it's pretty far north. Did, did the schools have to say that they themselves were proactively engaging in the segregation? No. What were they trying to remedy in general? Just in general, the um, discrimination and separation of the races. So like nationwide, right? Just across the board. Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you, Lainey. I think... I think that, that that's the that's the right answer to my question, right? If I had asked, you know, any of you last year before you came to my class, um, yeah, the, the good old days, right? There's no tax, there's no black, and think your life was so simple, um, right? Uh, why do we have a racial preferences? Why do we have affirmative action? You said, well, you know, uh, we have this long history of certain groups, primarily African Americans, getting a very, very a bad treatment in this country it goes on for centuries, right? Um, go look at the case from Dred Scott on. Go look at Crookshank, right? Go look at uh, these other uh, these other decisions. Um, you know, not till Brown did things start turning around. Um, that that's probably affirmative action. So let me just uh, just just focus on this for a minute. I gave you. I gave you the Marshall opinion, Baki. It's not in your book yet. Um, I'm adding it to the book for the next edition. I think it's. I think it's good. I think it, it, it's important because it tells a perspective that uh, isn't in the other cases. Uh, not in Gruder. Not in Fisher. It's just not there. So I went back and I added a you know almost a forty year old opinion to the book because I thought it I thought it was compelling. But let's just um, who's next uh, a colony here. Yes. Colin, let's just assume for a minute that Justice Marshall was in the majority, Justice Thurgood Marshall was in the majority. And let's say that the compelling interest was not about these sort of educational benefits, but the compelling interest was about <clears throat> remedying injustice, right? Remedying past and, and present racial discrimination. Let's just assume that for a minute. How would narrow tailoring look if we're trying to remedy past injustices, what, how does that alter this analysis? Um, I think um, it would probably mean that uh, if, if the, the factor of race is far too often determinative, 
is probably not narrowly tailored if they if they're overbroad. Well, well, let, let me let me ask this question. I don't think, I don't think I conveyed it correctly. Let's say the goal of affirmative action, the compelling state interest, is to remedy discrimination, both past and present. Right? Let's say that's the goal. Could the school then just say, you know what? Um, we have a society where there's racism. In our society, in our state, there's a 30% African-American population, but we have only, say, 5% African-American students. The way to remedy that is to match the percentage of our population to match the percentage of our law students or, or whatever college you have, right? We already said you can't do that with the diversity educational benefits rationale. Could you do that with a Justice Marshall opinion where it just yeah, says, think, yeah, good. Uh, I think it definitely makes narrowly tailored not so narrow anymore. Uh, it probably makes it a little bit more broad, I think. Well, uh, let me, I think you're committing the right idea, but it is narrowly tailored, right? If the goal is to achieve parity, that is to achieve equality numerically, then a numerical quota is narrowly tailored. Do you see that, Colin? Yeah, I'd agree with that. Okay, so let me, let me thanks Colin. Let me just, just sort of just repeat what I just said. Um, the decision of the courts to focus on these educational benefits from diversity was significant um, because it forced these universities to, oh, I don't want to put this too bluntly, to play a game, right? Everyone knows what's going on here. Everyone knows that Justice, uh, Justice Marshall's correct. Justice Marshall's accurately describing why these colleges have affirmative action, right? These schools didn't create these policies because of the benefits of education. That might be a, a perk, right? That, that might be something they appreciate. But the reason why these schools adopt these policies is to make up for past and present prejudice. Justice, um, Justice uh, President Johnson gave the speech at Howard University, which was very, very significant. I give you an excerpt in your book. He says, look, these are, these are people who have been uh, held back for, for centuries. And, you know, sometimes you need a head start in a race to catch up. And I think he expressed this point very, very, very cogently, very clearly. Um, so the reason why these schools create these policies was because of a sense of economic, uh, of just, just numerical uh, uh, injustice. Just there aren't enough black students in, in our colleges. Um, but what the court did in the Bakke case was they sort of told the schools, well, you can't say that, right? You can't say that your compelling interest is seeking racial equality. Why? Uh, is that Jessica? Jessica, in the Bakke case, this is from the University of California at Davis, why did this? Why did the court say that, or at least Justice Powell, why did the, the, the controlling opinion by Justice Powell say you can't look at compelling interest just focusing on racial equality? What's the problem with that argument? They said that it just wasn't a good enough reason. They didn't justify. Why? Uh, you're, you're correct, but tell me why, please. Um, I think because it just, it wouldn't make it. What does, be, sorry, go ahead. Jessica, let me ask you a follow-up question. To say that, you know, there's this massive racial inequality, what would the court have to say about society at large in order to endorse that compelling interest? What sort of judgment would the court have to make about our society? And that there's still a lot of uh, yeah. racism and separation. Did the court want to acknowledge that or, or address that? No. Why not? I think they wanted to be more specific and wanted to address the issue um, I'm sorry, I'm not really sure. No, I think I think you're on the right track. Um, what's the problem if the court were to endorse the theory, Jessica, that you know there is the majority oppressing the minority? What what's what's the risk for the court to acknowledge that's the sort of dynamic going on?
I guess they would have to reconsider um, the fact that race is suspect. If it's suspect classification, they would have to look at it more broadly. All right. Um, yeah. Okay. I think you're. I think you're on the right track. Thank you, Jessica. Let me let me try this a different way. Right. I think the court was, or I keep saying the court. In Baki, it was Justice Powell had the controlling opinion, but I'll just say the court because that's how it's viewed today. I think the court was very hesitant to adopt the Justice Marshall theory um, because it would really um, paint a broad brush of society at large as being uh, racist. I think that, that would be the implication. And they didn't want to adopt what you might call this majority-minority view of our society where we have these two classes. Um, because that would get the court in the business of deciding, you know, very broad issues of racial equality. Instead, instead the, the court simply sort of... Um, took the narrow way. And they said, well, we're not going to sit here and decide whether society at large has this sort of uh, embedded racism that justifies affirmative action. We'll pick a very narrow, um, almost technical interest and simply say, what's really important is having a diverse classroom so that way people can learn from the minority students and they can contribute. They're basically providing service, if you want to think of it that way, right? They're, 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 you know, they're coming on campus for the purpose of, of teaching others their, their ways, whatever, whatever it is. The court's not very specific on this. And it's a, it's a very, it's a very strange holding. Every year I teach, I'm like, wow, that, that's really what they're doing. So whenever you uh, come to campus, there's a huge sign on the wall that says diverse student body, right? Um, to the extent that that phrase is um, referencing Supreme Court precedent, which it might be, what it's basically meaning is not we want diverse students because it's, um, you know, historically underrepresented groups, but it's we want to uh, learn from these students. Hopefully they can provide something useful for us. It's, it's just a very, it's a very strange rationale. Um, and when you think about it, the, it's almost like the the opposite of how this issue is viewed today, um, that, you know, minority students are providing a service. Um, there, was a, there, was a, there, was a, there was a black law student, I think at University of Michigan, she had a blog post something a few months ago. Uh, oh, I forgot to post it. I'll, I'll find it later. Um, and she basically wrote, like, I'm tired of being used as, I'm, I'm tired of being viewed as someone who's here to provide a service that, you know, under the Supreme Court's precedent in, in Michigan case, I am here to, to teach other people how things are. And that shouldn't be my burden. In other words, you know, why am I here for that purpose? I'm, I'm here just to get education, uh, just like anybody else. And, and I have this additional burden others don't. And the court has recognized that the only reason why I'm admitted is to the, to the extent they can provide that service. Um, and, and I read that. I'm like, wow, that, that, that was, I mean, I hadn't considered in exactly those terms, but I think she... She wrote a very good, very good, very good post. And um, it brings, that's why I went back to Justice Marshall and I brought the Baki opinion back in to the casebook. Right? It never was, but I brought it into the casebook to think about, you know, what is the compelling interest we're talking about? And there's something demeaning about the diversity benefit model. I mean, just, I never quite put it together until I read that student's post. I was like, yeah, that that clicks here. That, 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 that makes some sense. Right? So the entire edifice of the modern affirmative action policy is based on what Justice Powell thought was the correct compelling interest. And then later in the Michigan case, they sort of endorsed Justice Powell. And at least for present purposes, that's still the, that's still the standard. Um, the sorts of racial equality stuff that most people think of is not the reason behind affirmative action. Now, um, when we're talking about affirmative action, we're primarily talking about public schools, right? The 14th Amendment. Uh, but private schools are also bound by that standard. Uh, Title VI is a federal law that's very important, which prohibits racism and discrimination in education. And there's actually litigation now 
against Harvard and UNC, uh, Chapel Hill, um, that they're using race in an, uncom- in an illegal fashion. Uh, and this will be litigated now. And I suspect the Supreme Court will take either the Harvard case or the UNC case in the next year or two. So we very well may get a different standard given the new court. Uh, I don't think the Justice Marshall opinion will be adopted. I think it'll probably go the other way, if anything. Um, but this is an area that's very much in flux. All right, we haven't even talked about the cases. We will, I promise. Um, uh, we'll get to the cases in a few minutes. But I, I want to just lay this foundation to sort of bring those two concepts into focus. Number one, what's compelling interest? Okay, the educational benefits that flow from diversity. It's not diversity by itself, right? It's not just we want diversity for diversity's sake. We want a balancing of X percentage of black students and Y percentage of Hispanic students, right? No, no, it's we need the benefits that flow from a diverse classroom. And then we ask, is it narrowly tailored, right? Is it narrowly tailored? A quota, a numerical balancing is not narrowly tailored because it uses race in an imprecise fashion. Race can only be used in order to achieve those educational benefits. And if a student's being admitted and that won't promote educational benefits, in theory at least, that policy is invalid. So it's a very weird, just, just not the what not the way people think of how racial preferences work. Right. All right. Let me pause for a minute because I've been talking a little bit too much. Uh, Questions so far? Yeah, Macy, go ahead. So that standard that you keep talking about, the benefits of diversity in the classroom, is that the standard from this case? Okay. That's a standard that Justice Powell adopted in Baki, which we'll get to in a few minutes. I'm sort of jumping around, but I want to give this background first. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jose writes in the chat, uh, is the implication that the government should have never intervened through affirmative action? I don't, I don't think I'm implying anything one way or the other. Uh, I think what I'm trying to convey is that the decision of the court to limit the only valid state interest to be the, um, the educational benefits, that was significant. And that seriously curtailed how, let me be blunt, how honest colleges could be. I think the Bakke standard almost encouraged schools to do this sort of song and dance where they're saying one thing, they're doing another. Um, no one, okay, now I'm getting cynical. The schools don't actually believe that's what they're doing. They're trying to actually achieve racial equality. They're, they're doing what Justice Marshall said you're supposed to do, but they're pretending. Um, I was actually in college, I'm dating myself, in 2003, when the, when the Michigan cases were being argued. And I remember I had a professor in some class and she, she, she ran some of the diversity program. I remember she said in class, we don't really care what the Supreme Court does. No matter what they rule, we'll find a way to use affirmative action. And she was actually very honest. I mean, there's no recording back then. No one had phones. Right? But she said, yeah, it doesn't really matter what the school does. We'll just come up with another rationale. If the court says you can't do X, we'll do Y. So they were going to do what they wanted to do anyway. It's basically just a song and dance. And Justice Ginsburg says in her uh, separate opinion, let's just be honest here and let's not encourage the schools to mislead us and let's let them do what they actually need to do in the first place. All right, Lainey, I see your hands up. Yeah, so I was following these cases um, that the educational benefits are, it's about state action. So how did Title VI pull the private schools into it? Title VI says if a, fed, if a school receives federal money, it must comply with this non-discrimination provision. Um, every school receives federal money except for maybe one or two. Uh, all of you have these lovely federal student loans that pay my lovely salary, right? Not, not really, right? But, um, you know, this the, the Zoom you're watching now is paid for by federal money. Um, they're bound by federal law. And the courts have seemed to suggest that whatever the standard is for the 14th Amendment, you have the same standard for this Title VI. I, I actually think it's, uh, you're welcome, thank you, Moses, right? I actually think that uh, Title VI is even stricter than the 14th Amendment, but we haven't gotten there quite yet. All right, thank you. The private schools aren't really private. If you accept federal money, you're not private, no. There, there, there are a couple of schools that will not accept federal money, no federal loans, nothing. No, I mean, I can count them on one hand probably, but there, there are a few. 
I think Hillsdale's one, and maybe a few others. Hillsdale's a college in Michigan. All right, so we just get this background, right? Just to, just the the sort of the sort of place we're in because of Baki from 1978 um, has left you know legal justifications different than people think they are, and that basically forces schools to make stuff up at why they're doing what they're doing. This is why uh, you know the comment about having the the educated. Uh, son of the the black doctor in Dallas and the poor black person, right? They have to they have to make that argument to show that look, we're actually trying to get different types of people to contribute to the classroom. We're not just looking for sort of poor black people; we want wealthy black people as well, right? And and the Bakke standard forced them to go through those sorts of arguments. All right, anything else before we get started? It's an hour in. All right, so we have three batches of cases today. And I guess it makes sense in all at once. We first have Baki from 78. We have the Michigan cases, Gruder and Gratz from, 19, I'm sorry, from 2003. I was in college, I remember those cases well. And then we have the Texas cases from UT. In fact, some of you may have actually been in college when these cases were decided. Um, uh, we're not done with this topic. Uh, there are no more cases for you to study, but I am waiting for the Harvard case to come up. Uh, the, the premise of the Harvard case is that uh, Harvard's basically discriminating against Asian kids, that they're actually making it harder for Asians to be admitted because there's so many, uh, even though Asians are a racial minority, numerically speaking. Um, uh, yeah, exactly. That's why the Lenny says the Harvard model is ironic that Harvard's one being challenged because they were the one who were praised back in the 70s. Yeah, the Harvard one, I think, is, is and also uh, there's a new suit against Yale as well, very similar to the Harvard suit. Um, that will continue after the inauguration as well. All right, who's up next? Uh, Colin Jessica. Uh, Raymond, you here? Raymond? Laura, are you here? Hi. Yeah, I'm here. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Laura. Um, Laura, could you please give us the facts in uh, uh, Baki, please? Oh, sure. Um, so it was the University of California um, that was a medical school that denied admission, well, denied admission to a um, white man who ended up suing um, because the university had a hundred seats and like six, 16, um, I think they said it was 16 that were dedicated to minority students. And he said that that was a limitation that caused him to not be accepted to this medical school. Now, Lori, is there something strange about uh, a white guy suing for racial discrimination. Is there something that maybe Justice Marshall perhaps wasn't so, so keen about? Yeah, and I, I had the same feeling when I read it. So I do think it's a little strange. Where, where have we had this before where, where a white person asserted a claim to equal protection? Can you think of the case? We did a case where there was this, this exact issue came up. Um, was it... Loving versus Virginia? Well, oh yeah, Loving is an example. I'm thinking of an even earlier case. Loving is a good example, true. What was, uh, what was the case where a justice said, why are we having a white person bringing a lawsuit to challenge racial discrimination? What case am I thinking of? Oh, I don't remember. Anyone? Yes. So, if I'll sell property, what's the case? Jose is right. Uh, what's the case? Which judge complained? There it is. Ashley, say it. Oh, uh, Buchanan. Very Buchanan. good, Buchanan. In that case, thank you, Ashley, yeah, correct. You had a white plaintiff who was trying to sell his land to a black property owner. Remember that one? And then you had just Holmes in his in his like dissent saying, what are we doing here, right? This is not right. We should not be having a white plaintiff. He throws a test case. Um We'll do another case later this semester where um, uh, 
The state of Oklahoma allows girls to buy beer at 18, but boys to buy beer at 21. And then you have a, basically a guy saying, this is not fair. Why can't I buy beer like the girl does at 18? Right? And Justice Rehnquist, for instance, said, saying, what is this? Why do we have men suing that they're being sex discriminated, right? Isn't this about harming women? So in those cases, you actually had civil rights groups pick the majority, right, the, the white guy or the male, to challenge the ordinance. Here, you have, again, a, a white person who wasn't the racial minority, I'm sorry, racial majority, suing to challenge um, uh, suing to challenge this classification. Lenny, I'm not making this case up. Craig V. Boren, B-O-R-E-N. We'll do it in a week or so. I promise it's a real case. All right, that was Laura. Okay, Alejandro here. Alejandro? Uh, Virginia, are you here? Yes, hi. Yeah, hi, Virginia. How are you? Thank you. All right, so Baki challenges the, uh, the university's admission policy, which I think Laura said a minute ago has basically what's called a, a quota set aside, right? Where I think there were 16 out of 100 seats that were deserved or dedicated for racial minorities, right? Yeah. All right, so let's talk about Scrutiny for a minute, right? Is this policy, Virginia, narrowly tailored? We have a racial classification. Is there narrow tailoring? Uh, they put a certain number on it. You know, they say 16 out of 100. That's the number. 16, so I, right? Is that narrowly tailored? Um, it's a precise number, but I think it's not narrowly tailored. Why not? I think, uh, if you have to, if you have, if you put a number, why, why 16? Like why 16 out of a hundred? What, what's that, what's that uh, number mean to me? If, 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 if we have to be narrow, we have to, we have to scrutinize it to the nth degree, and I have to understand not arbitrarily why 16 out of 100 is the number that's going to... Um, oh, that's very good. So you said you can't arbitrarily set 16. I think you're, you're exactly in the right track. Why... Let's try this one more time. What is the state trying to achieve here with, 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 their, with, their, with their racial quota? The state's trying to achieve... Uh, the benefit of diversity on their campus. All right. Well, that, that's what Justice Powell says, right? It's the only valid interest. Yeah. How does picking the number 16 achieve that? In other words, where, where does this number 16 come from? Is there any evidence of why they picked 16? Uh, there, there's 100 seats for the entering class. They picked 16 for... Uh, to set aside for, for minorities. Did they pull this number out of a hat? I mean, where did this number come from? Do we even know where it came from? I, I don't. I don't no, you're right. I'm, I'm asking an unfair question. We have no idea, right? All right, thank you, Virginia. All right, so basically the school says we want diversity to make the educational experience better. Um, I suppose, you know, this is a medical school. I mean, what if the school has said... We want to have a diverse class. That way we'd have uh, uh, doctors who serve underprivileged communities, right? That if we have more minority med students, they'll go back and serve their communities, rural communities, but they don't have access to health care. They could have said that, but the court said, no, no, that's not good enough, right? We, that's not a good enough rationale. You see, by the court narrowing the rationale to these educational diverse, diversity benefits, it makes it almost impossible for the school to justify a straight-up quota. Eleni, go ahead. So when I read that line about, and, and maybe that was just part of the thought process and not the actual opinion, but, oh, we want these disadvantaged students to come so that they'll circle back to that same community, and maybe that's the servitude that the U of M student blogged about. Like, who says I have to go back to that community? I'm, you know, hmm. I might want to go to City A or I might want to go to City B. I don't necessarily want to go back. To that community and so now you're giving me a preference but there's strings attached you're expecting me to go back to a certain yeah community. so you're saying is they can't just be admitted like anyone else they're admitted for a specific purpose yeah there's something you know uh you know I'll, I'll try to make this point as carefully as i can i'm probably gonna screw it up but 
the, the I hate to screw things up, but the, the, the affirmative action cases um, presume a certain type of, I don't want to say control, that's not the right word, but a certain type of um, uh, expectation, that's a better word, expectation for those admitted, that they're being admitted for certain expectation, a certain reason. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that, that's, that's part of this model that we expect students to come for a certain reason that the other 84 students, they can come for whatever reason they want, but these 16, we want them for a specific reason. And it's not, we're just admitting them because we think they're good students that, that they serve, they serve a value. Um, perhaps the answer is that the school shouldn't have to justify themselves, that, that maybe the the court has put this burden on the school to make a decision in this context and explain it, right? Let me let me take a step back. Uh, did any of you ever work admissions when you were an undergrad in the admissions office? Anyone? Raise your hand. Anyone? So sometimes people volunteer. Yeah. Uh, I see, Oh, a lot of hands. Okay. Uh, am I right in saying that this process could be pretty random and pretty, like, unclear? People can admit it for a lot of reasons. Uh, anyone just just raise your hand. Smiha, what do you think? What was your experience there? Uh, I worked at a grad under or sorry grad school admissions, um, and it was random. Random. Yes. Like, could this? Could you? Like, could if if you had to go to court and explain, here's why we admitted person A, but here's why we denied admission to person B. Could you give a reason explanation for those sorts of decisions? Not necessarily. It was mostly making sure they had enough people enrolled in the program. Oh, they just wanted numbers? They just wanted numbers, yeah. Yeah, anyone so else? They were willing to make like exceptions for people who had lower GMAT scores or um, GPAs if they were, you know, somewhat, they seemed somewhat successful within their interviews. Yeah. Anyone else want to add anything? Okay, thanks, Miha. You know, I, I served on the admissions committee once and only once. And they never invited me back. Uh, <laughs> I think I said no to everyone. <laughs> like, we, there, there's like a grid the school has. If you're within a certain GPA LSAT range, you're basically admitted automatically, right? But then there are people who are sort of at the margins. And then you have to decide whether they're worthy of admission. And like, I think I said no to all of them. I never got invited back. I was, I was like, no, that's a, that, that. Sorry, uh, you know, that probably shouldn't surprise you. But um, it's an arbitrary process. And, and uh, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, it's an arbitrary pro. Look, at, look there, were, there were people who I just, I, who I doubt if this was the right path for them. And, and you know, maybe it's too paternalistic. But I, I, look, we have an attrition rate. I mean, you guys know this. How many people, oh, bad example, but you have no grades. Generally, at the end of your 1L, some of your classmates just don't come back. Why? Because they couldn't make it, right? And I, I actually think the school is a moral imperative to not admit people who can't make it. I think it's almost immoral to admit someone, take their tuition for a year if they can't cut it. I, 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 that's actually my base. It's not being mean, but if I see a person who I think couldn't handle the first year of law school, uh, why am I going to admit them, make them pay 30 grand tuition, take a year of their life, and then they have to just leave after being on academic probation? Some people pull themselves up and they surprise me, right? And it happens. But but I had, I let's say I had a presumption of denial, if you want to put it that way. My presumption was this person should maybe consider other choices. So but I'm going too far afield. But my point is it's an arbitrary process, right? It's random. So maybe the answer is that the schools should have to defend themselves, that they think this is the right thing to do. They should get deference, right? So this is the trajectory from Bakke to Gruder to Fisher, right? Are you actually reviewing these policies with strict scrutiny? Or are you deferring to the decisions of the institution that they know it's best for their college and best for their students, right? Fisher, I'm sorry, from Bakke to Gruder and Gruder to Fisher, what you see is strict scrutiny in theory um, but deference in reality, what do I mean by that? 
what you see in this 40 year, or I guess 30 something year trajectory is they use the language of strict scrutiny and narrow tailoring. But what they're really doing is saying, we'll let you do this if you say the right things and you structure it the right way, right? They're sort of greenlighting a specific type of a racial preference, right? Cassidy writes, you have to say it's narrowly tailored, but it can actually be quite loose. All right, so let's wrap up the Baki case, right? The upshot of the Baki case is the court split in a very fractured way. I don't, it's in your book, you can read the specifics. Justice Powell cast the deciding vote. Now you ask, Josh, how can it be that you need five votes for a majority, but where the court's divided, one vote will do it? This is one of the most infuriating aspects of Supreme Court practice. You need five for a majority, but if there's no five block majority, one vote becomes a majority opinion. How the hell is that possible? It's just this bizarre rule. No one likes it, but that's how the court practices. So in the Bakke case, the court, oops, the court split 4-1-4. Four, four. You had four votes going one way, four votes going the other way, and you had Justice Powell in the middle. And what that means is the most narrow, the most narrow opinion was Justice Powell, and his was viewed as controlling. Um, what does that mean? The quota system from the UC uh, uh, Davis School was invalid. You can't have straight up racial balancing. You can't try to mirror percentages. You can't have numerical quotas. But Justice Powell looked favorably upon the program at Harvard. And he said, the Harvard program uses race as one factor of many. What's often called a plus factor, where race is a plus factor, where it, it can be a plus on top of an otherwise good application. How much of a plus, uh, Justice Powell did not say. All right. All right, so that's Baki. In the wake of Baki, the status of affirmative action was sort of in flux for almost 20 years. No one really knew what was going on. Right, the court just did not take any case. I think they were too divided. They didn't want to fracture it on the issue again. And in the mid-1990s, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, based in Louisiana, decided a case from Texas called Hopwood. And the Fifth Circuit declared the UT affirmative action policy unconstitutional. Right, and, and they said it was not narrowly tailored. Um, in response, Texas creates this top 10% plan, which we'll get to in the Fisher case, um, let me be blunt. The top 10% plan may seem neutral, but it's not. It was designed by a UH law professor named Michael Levas. He retired about a year ago. Very, very nice guy. He's a good, good friend. He, uh, he's uh, chilling in New Mexico now. He's, he's li living the life of retirement. Uh, but the top 10% program was designed to take advantage of the fact that most schools in Texas are racially stratified, that if you have a predominantly African-American school, the top 10% will be mostly black kids. And you have a predominantly white school, the top 10% will be mostly white kids, right? This policy was designed to inject a certain number of racial minorities into the UT system without saying so. It's almost this song and dance, right? We're doing one thing, we're saying another. This is what Justice Powell forced upon us. We're just all engaging this decade-long charade. Um, but then we get to the Michigan cases in the early 2000s. All right. Uh, we have these two cases, Gruder and Gratz. Gratz involved the undergraduate program at UM, University of Michigan, and Gruder was the law school at the University of Michigan. All right. Uh, who's next? Uh, Cassie, are you up in both classes today? Is that right? Yeah, yeah it's it, my golden day. Yeah, it's like uh, when the you know when the uh, you have like a lunar eclipse from both the sun and the you know everything just sort of just lines up. Yeah. All right. Uh, you want to start off, please, with the facts in uh, Gruder, the law school case, the uh, UM law school case. Uh, Gruder had a young lady who uh, she applied to the law school at the University of Michigan, and she was highly qualified, but was not admitted and said that, you know, if you looked at all of the 
the numbers. Um, obviously, the university placed a really strong preference toward for uh, for uh, applicants from racial or ethnic minority groups, and therefore her she was being uh, discriminated against. Okay. What what was her argument, uh, Cassidy, that the UM policy was unconstitutional? Again, given Baki, what was her argument? So that, that it was given, um, there, there are obviously still more, much more weight given to people from racial minorities. And so therefore, um, it was a, another fit issue. Fit. Okay, good. Tell me more. That, that, um, that by, by having this strong preference for people from these groups, um, it was not the, uh, the policy uh, was not narrowly tailored enough to achieve the, object, the stated objective, which was diversity among the student body. Okay, very good. Thank you so much, Cassidy. All right, so uh, I think her name was uh, Barbara Gruder, if memory serves. So, so Barbara Gruder um, had good grades. Um, you know, she, she did well. Uh, she had a good undergraduate LSAT. Everything was good. Um, but she was not admitted to the law school program at UM, which I'm sure, as you all know, is a top you know, top 10 law school. It's a very good law school. I, I could have gotten to UM. Didn't apply, but I could have got, I could not have gotten in. Um, this goes to the court. And the court considers the law school program, all right? But they're also considering the undergraduate program. Michael, you want to give me, please, the facts in Gratz, which is about the UM undergraduate program? Sure. That one, it was... It was the same university, obviously. Um, and um, the kid wanted to get in. Um, they said that there was a point system that... Um, the, the most you can get when someone was from the administration was reviewing your application, they reviewed for um, your high school, your extracurricular activities, your essay, and they also considered race. And the most you could get was 150 points. Um, if you got 100 points, you were in. And the point that they weighed the heaviest with 20 points was what your race was. And the uh, student, I want to say, was a, a, a I'm sure it was a white female. Yep, yep. Uh, uh, her name was Jennifer Grass. Jennifer, yeah, that's it. Uh, she was not admitted. And so she said that um, this policy was unconstitutional because it gave more credit to your race rather than your other qualifications. According, Michael, one more question for you. According to uh, Jennifer Grass, was this policy narrowly tailored? No. Um, they, she's, this was kind of like I almost want to say excessive baggage, like it was too much coverage, you know, in order to meet the educational. Coverage. Yeah, in other words, it used race in a very imprecise fashion. Just it yeah. gave you. Let me put let me put it this way, it gave you points in your application, simply for being a member of the race, without regard to whether you would actually provide the benefits on campus. Right, just presume that if you check the box, you would provide these benefits. Whereas the law school. Right? Whereas the law school, at least on paper, said we are considering how each applicant's race would provide a benefit to the campus. Right? So let's just talk about this just for a minute, right? I want to draw a distinction between the law school and the undergraduate policy because it proves to be very important. Um, the Bakke case said that you can't have some sort of mechanical numerical feature where you just admit a certain number of black students. Okay, so the undergraduate didn't do exactly that. Instead, they said, we're going to admit to the law school students who can provide specific benefits in the classroom. And we're going to assess whether each student actually provides that benefit. Um, and, and, and if the, by the way, uh, the record in this case is, is just stunning. Um, 
one of the allegations was that the school actually said we want Hispanic students, but not Cubans. Uh, because Cubans <laughs> are basically more like white people <laughs> than too conservative. <laughs> this is in the record. Like they, they really considered how each racial group would affect the educational climate on campus and, and in, in brutally honest ways. Uh, this is all, all on the record. Whereas the undergraduate didn't do that. Now, keep in mind, the undergraduate probably is like 40, 50,000 students. This is a huge school, and the law school is much smaller. Uh, if you actually work in the admissions office at UM undergrad, they were just stamping applications. They probably did not have the time to actually review each one carefully. They're just, they're just going through a grid. And they created this numerical matrix where they would add points, where basically you know, having a perfect SAT score was worth less than being a certain racial uh, group. The court splits. And Justices Breyer and O'Connor um, were the deciding votes in both cases. In the law school case, Justice O'Connor wrote the majority opinion. And she says that because race is used as a plus factor, as one factor, one of many factors, it's permissible. But in the undergraduate case, it's actually Rehnquist writes majority opinion, who says, well, race is being used here mechanically. It can't be done consistently with Grutter. I'm sorry, consistently with Bakke. All right. So everyone can have the case split. And O'Connor and Breyer were the majority in both cases. And Breyer's an interesting guy. I mean, he, he really, like, he reminds me of Hamlet. He just struggles. You can just see he's struggling with things. He just talks out loud and he's just really laboring over issues. Oh, yesterday they had the arguments in the Obamacare case. We had a Zoom moment where Breyer started asking a question and apparently Roberts couldn't hear him. So, so Roberts interrupted Breyer mid-sentence and said, okay, thank you, Justice Alito. And I'm like, whoa. And then Alito's like, um, I think Breyer has some time left. And Roberts like, no, Justice Alito, you go now. Uh, so Roberts really screwed up. And then later uh, Roberts actually apologized. Like, I'm sorry, Justice Breyer, would you like to go? And Breyer said, no, I'm good, thank you. It's, 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 it's insane with the Supreme Court all arguing by a basically teleconference and, and the chief can't take people off mute uh, uh, correctly. Um, but the, the Grutter grad split had Breyer and O'Connor in the middle in both cases. I think it's, it's, it's significant in that O'Connor is not in the court anymore. Uh, I don't know what Breyer will be here for. He's uh, in his 80s. Uh, we'll see what happens. Um, one more question for uh, uh, Daryl, you here? Uh, no, Heather, you here? Hi. Did I call you twice in a row also? Yes. Oh my God, so you and Cassie are on the train today. Okay. Um, Heather, uh, let me ask you this question, please. How, well, let me, what is the end game, right? In other words, does a school, will the school have this interest in using racial preferences indefinitely? Forever? Forever and ever? Perm is it a permanent physical? No, it is it forever? Um, I think it, it kind of depends. Like right now, it's like the policy stand. It doesn't have like a time limit or anything. So it doesn't really say that it's for a set period of time. Did Justice O'Connor identify any outer limits of when maybe this might, be, might not be useful? Like, uh, it was 25 years, I think. 25 years. What? Well, we'll get to the 25 year number one minute, but what's the. How much diversity is the school actually trying to achieve? They, they give a phrase to describe it, right? How much diversity. It, you know, what, what are they trying to achieve? What's that phrase they use? Is it the, the race-conscious admissions policies must be limited in time? Okay. But the specific phrase, um, anyone, anyone have it? Yeah. Yeah. Cassie, critical mass. Critical mass. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Heather. Okay. 
the, the court says there's this phrase called critical mass, which is a phrase that's not defined. And the concept is, in order to get these benefits from having a diverse classroom, you need to have a certain number of um, diverse students, right? What is that number? Uh, the school will not tell you, right? But there's this, there's this number, critical mass. When you have a certain percentage of the classroom is from different backgrounds, these benefits are possible. Okay. Now, uh, Gerald, you here? Yes, sir. How are you doing? Thank you. Thank you for asking. I'm doing well. Uh, Gerald, let me ask you this question, please. We know from Baki that the court can't set a numerical quota, right? That you, you can't have like X number, X percentage, whatever, right? What's the difference, Dural, between having a quota of 16 seats and having a critical mass? Well, how are those numbers different? Um, well, I, would, I mean, I think the most like, obvious would be that if you have just 16 seats that are just for a minority, that you're limiting the amount of seats to anybody else who can try to get into the school. Right. And with a critical mass, you're kind of giving an equal opportunity to everybody. And are, you're just, are you? But if we're saying we need a certain percentage of students to reach this goal, a certain number, how is that not a quota? Well, I mean, you're saying you need a certain percentage, but you're not really getting a certain percentage so that you you can't really be told that you are making sure that a certain percentage are getting in. You're just saying, oh, we want a critical mass. And, and how much is that critical mass? In other words, can you tell the court when you reach yeah. that critical mass? Yeah, and it's not, you, you can't ever tell that. And it's, it's, a, it's a, I feel like a purposely vague statement. Oh, I think you got what I'm looking for. So if a court asks the lawyer, what is a critical mass? How do you know when you reach it? What are they going to say, Daryl? Uh, you, you just know it. We'll, know. we'll tell you when we get there, right? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, very, very good, Daryl. Thank you so much for the answer. I think, I think you got what I was looking for. Um, the school say, look, we need... Affirmative action to achieve a critical mass of diversity, right? That's what we're trying to achieve. We won't tell you what that critical mass is. We may not even know what that is, but it's a number, but it's not a number. This is this sort of song and dance where schools have to be almost, I don't want to say disingenuous because that's a mean word, but they have to almost like create a, a ruse for what they're trying to do. What they want is for the numbers in their school to mirror population numbers. That's what, or, or if, if not even greater, that, that's what they're trying to achieve. UM was trying to achieve the exact same goal that Baki, I'm uh, sorry, that, that California did 40 years earlier. They just couldn't say it with the same words. Now, 25 years elapsed between 1978 and 2003, between the, the Baki case and the Michigan cases. And then Justice O'Connor says in Gruder, you know, Maybe we won't need this in 25 years more, which puts us in 2028. We're now, oh God, almost eight years away where time goes by quickly. 2028, that's two presidential election cycles away. Oh God, Lord help us. Right. Let's we'll hope we're all still standing. 2028. Now, did she actually mean in 2028 we'll not need front of action? Of course not. And I think O'Connor has actually kind of expressed some regret. She put that line in because it's being used for a lot of, uh, you know, attacks. Uh, when the Fisher case came to the Supreme Court in 2015, or was it 13, the first one, Justice Scalia asked, hey, how are we doing that 25-year clock? He was kind of being a jerk. And the lawyer's like, well, we don't think it means literally 25 years, right? The lawyer of UT. But O'Connor seems to suggest that um, there is an end game, right? You're trying to achieve a goal, and eventually you'll achieve that goal. Uh, in other words, the propriety of affirmative action is fluid. It's based not on some sort of uh, absolute truths of equality, but as sort of this temporary band-aid, like a temporary measure to achieve certain benefits, but it may not be worthwhile forever. Uh, O'Connor is also deferential. You know, we have to ask ourselves, is this actually strict scrutiny? Is the law school policy, in fact, narrowly tailored? Right. Uh, Justice Thomas doesn't think so. Uh, Justice Thomas, he was pissed here. He was livid. Uh, uh, you know, there, there are cases where Thomas dissents based on angry. He's very upset here. 
Um, and let me just pause here to talk a little bit about the history of Justice Thomas, and, and I'll do Sotomayor as well. Uh, Justices Thomas and Sotomayor were, were, were contemporaries. They were at Yale Law School um, at roughly the same time. I think they graduated maybe a year or two apart. Uh, I don't know if they knew each other, but they, they were on campus at the same time at Yale Law School. Um, Thomas came from a poor, poor, poor family uh, in Georgia. His his dad left his mom, and his mom basically gave him and his brother to their grandparents to raise. The mom couldn't raise the kids. Um, and, and Thomas grew up in a very, you know, an educated home. His I think his grandfather had like an elementary school education, not much more than that. Uh, and he managed to make his way through high school. He graduated, went to college at Holy Cross, and he was admitted to Yale. And Thomas admits he was admitted because of the affirmative action policy. There's no, there was no doubt about it. And for the longest time, he resented it. He hated that his education was diminished because he was admitted through that policy, that he wasn't there like everyone else. He had this burden that he was only admitted because of his skin color. And for the longest time, he wouldn't go back to Yale. He wouldn't even hire Yale law clerks. Eventually, he made events with Yale and things sort of got better, but for the longest time he resented it. But you can see this resentment in his opinion where he says, you know, he quotes Frederick Douglass, he's like, leave, leave, leave us alone. Don't, don't, don't try and give us certain burdens and, and obligations, just treat us like everyone else. And then Justice Sotomayor, uh, who joined the court in 2009 or 10, uh, was at Yale at the exact same time. And she became a, a, a a staunch advocate for racial preferences. And she says, this gave me opportunities that, you know, I would have never had as growing up as a, as a poor girl from the Bronx. Um, and and it's, it's remarkable that you have these two lawyers who reach the pinnacle of their profession, both Supreme Court justices, who both grew up in very poor homes and, and you know, in, in very different places, New York City and Georgia, for worlds apart. And they reach such complete opposite decisions on these, on these issues. And they still get along. They're friends. They all get, they all get along quite well. Uh, I like to show this is you, you can basically disagree with someone without hating them. It's a good lesson to learn. Uh, but you really see in the Thomas dissent, you see in the Thomas dissent this 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 anger and this resentment towards these policies. Um, agree or disagree, at least have to consider the Thomas view. I think it's worthwhile to at least consider. All right, questions in the Michigan case before we go into the uh, the UT Austin case. Anything? All right. All right, let's go on. Um, the last place is the is the one closest to home. It involves UT. I'm sure there are a lot of people who went to UT. Uh, some of you may have been admitted under the 10% policy. Uh, some of you may have been admitted under, uh, uh, maybe went to A&M or, or Texas Tech during that policy. They're, 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 all those state schools have a similar... Uh, model. Um, we have the plaintiff, Abby Fisher. Uh, Abby went to Sugarland High School. Uh, one of my students years ago was her classmate. <laughs> As you said, Abby was very weird. Uh, she, no one liked her, apparently. I, I mean, how do, what do I make of this one? No one liked her. You know, they, they always say this in high school, but uh, uh, you know, people apparently didn't like her. Uh, Abby went to LSU. Uh, she played, was it the flute or the trombone? She played some sort of an instrument, and she was also on the bowling team, if I remember the, the profile. Did I say, what did I say uh, in the recorded class? You said she was weird. That's what the student said. I, I, I said the student said she was weird, and I, I remember that. I can't remember, this was in 2013, this is a ways back. I was like, yeah, that girl is weird. Uh, fun fact, uh, Sugarland High School doesn't exist anymore. Is that right? What happened to it? High school end? Is it is Dulles High School? Did they rename it? Oh, okay. Um, there was actually two plaintiffs in this case originally. It was Abby Fisher and another girl. Uh, but the other girl dropped out uh, of the case. Why? Uh, she went to SME Law School. And as a law student, she did not want this case named after her. So poor Abby was by herself. Can you imagine being in law school, sitting there, and you have a Supreme Court case about you? Uh, I, I, I think she wanted that. That would be probably not the best thing. Um, all right. So the UT system, 
um, had a policy that uh, resembled the Michigan policy. Um, but it used race in a little bit more of a um, black box fashion. What do I mean by a black box fashion? It wasn't really clear how race was being used. You know, they said race was being used as one factor of many, but it wasn't entirely clear that they were. So think of it this way, right? The UT policy was somewhere between the law school and the undergraduate, right? It's somewhere in between. And it's not clear if it was closer to the law school policy or closer to the undergraduate policy. All right. Uh, UT also had this top 10% plan, which was another means by which they could attract minority students to the policy. So Abby applies to law school and she's denied entry. Um, just one note about strategy. This, you know, college takes four years to litigate. I'm sorry, college takes four years to complete. The case took more than four years to litigate. By the time... <clears throat> the Supreme Court resolved this case, Abby had graduated already. She might, might ask, you know, how can you solve this case? She was suing for a refund of her application fee. That was her damage. You know, when you apply to college, you put like, well, was it $75, $100? Bucks? I don't even know what it is now. I'm sorry, I'm out of date. Um, whatever it is, you pay an application fee and she was suing for a refund. That was, that was her injury. Alaney, go ahead. You said law school, but this was just general undergraduate. I'm sorry, I misspoke. I mean, she was applying to the undergraduate. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Thank you. You're right. Thank you for correcting me. Um, so Abby challenges it. The Fifth Circuit upholds the policy. Um, they apply uh, what you might call deference, right? They say, we're not going to interfere with how the school structures or policy. That's for their judgment. Um, was that holding consistent with strict scrutiny? I don't think so, but the circuit court did it. The Supreme Court grants review, but the court is shorthanded. Justice Kagan is not participating. Why? She was the Obama administration solicitor general, the top lawyer, and she probably advised on this case. And the general rule is if you advise on a case, You cannot sit on it as a judge. So we redact to eight justices. And the backstory here, I think, is very significant. Originally, there were five votes to declare the UT policy unconstitutional. Uh, this was the first big affirmative action case since Justice O'Connor had left the court. And Justice Alito, her replacement, was to her right. Justice Kennedy, if you recall, had dissented in Grutter. And then as the story goes, there was this very bitter back and forth uh, where Justice Sotomayor wrote this, apparently this very, very livid dissent, accusing the majority of just you know, being intolerant to, ra to race. And this uh, apparently had an effect on Justice Kennedy, who didn't like disagreement. And he modified his opinion. And he was able to make the court almost unanimous, such that Sotomayor could join. And the revised opinion said, well, we don't think the lower court applied strict scrutiny. Wink, wink, nod, nod, lower court tried again. So they're trying to say, don't make us reverse you. You just try it again. You know, if the lower court does the right thing, doesn't come back to us, no problem. So it goes back to the lower court. And the Fifth Circuit panel calls Justice Kennedy's bluff. They, they write the exact same opinion. It's really no difference. Like, yep, yeah, okay, we'll think about it. We were right the first time. So the court grants review a second time. And now that the court had given uh, a chance to the lower court to fix it, now they were like, all right, we're going to reverse this. Uh, so the case is argued. And it looks like, again, there are five votes to declare the UT policy invalid. But then in February of 2016, oh my God, almost five years ago, Justice Kennedy, uh, Justice Kennedy, Justice Scalia passed away suddenly. 
the court was now down to seven justices, right? Seven. And there were no longer five votes to declare the policy unconstitutional. So we get this opinion, it was called Fisher 2, that uh, it stunned me. I was like, what the heck is this? Where by four to three vote, Justice Kennedy says that the UT policy is valid and will defer to the university. Now, is this sort of deference consistent with strict scrutiny? Uh, you know, we start with this lofty standard, narrowly tailored to sort of compelling governmental interest. And we ask, is are these educational benefits actually compelling? Maybe yes, maybe no. But at least we can see if it's narrowly tailored. But now, there's no real requirement of narrow tailoring. The government can say, we think we want to achieve a critical mass of diversity. We won't tell you what that is, but it's there. And we need to use race in this fashion. We'll really tell you how we're using race. Just trust us. And the court ultimately says, okay, we'll trust you. We'll defer to you. And they pulled the UT policy. That was, was it 2016, 15, 16? Was, uh, yeah, no, I guess it was 2016 after Scalia died. So it was four years ago, more than four years ago. Um, I don't know that this case is good law for long. You know, in, in your book, I had a little note saying, what's the value of a four to three decision? I put that there quite deliberately. I think the chief would say that that Fisher 2 is not a precedent. It's not a title to presidential value. I think he's probably right about that. A four to three decision is not precedent. Uh, so there's nothing to overturn. If you have to ask me what I think happens, they'll take the Harvard case and they'll say that Harvard case is inconsistent with Grutter. And they'll go back to Grutter. Uh, and they'll just kill uh, the um, Fisher case. So I don't think Fisher's good law for long. I think it's on its last legs. Uh, Abby's going to ball a spare on this one. I think she'll, she didn't get the first one, but she, she'll clean up on the second frame. Uh, sorry. Terrible. Um, but I, I don't think Fisher's long for this world. Yes, Macy, go ahead. So hypothetically, if this was on an exam question, would you want us to use Fisher as the president? Yes, absolutely. Or? Absolutely. It's correct law as of 2020, November 11th. Uh, okay. may not be next year. Okay, thank you. I, I can't ask you to have the gift of uh, clairvoyance, right? They predict the future. That, that, that would be unfair. Uh, but I'm telling you all, I'm, tell, I'm telling all of you as responsible citizens to Wolf to pay attention to this. You're going to have kids one day who go to college. I mean, the, the standards here will probably be different, uh, public and private as well. Okay, so going along with that, could you like rule statement? what this holding really is, I'm a little bit confused. I'm going to do that towards the end in like a minute or two, I promise. Perfect. Uh, are there other questions? I'll be happy to answer Macy's question. I want to see if anyone else has any generic questions for her first. All right. Nothing? All right. Let me try to, if I can, summarize this doctrine because it's not um, at all clear. But let me do my best. Uh, Baki is the first case. Um Baki explained that the state has a compelling interest to achieve certain educational benefits from a diverse classroom, right? But to achieve that, you need to have narrow tailoring. That is, you don't use race more than you need to. Uh, the quota system at, UT, sorry, at UC was bad, <clears throat> but race abuse is one of many factors without much precision. Gruder then adopts the Justice Powell standard that says, yes, race views is one of main decisions. And Michigan told you with some clarity how they were using race as one of many, as one of many factors, right? So you at least had some insight into what the college was doing. But UT was more vague. They couldn't really explain how race was being used. They basically said, trust us. Right, you need to defer to our judgment over what is the correct way of using race. Uh, Fisher one suggested that that was not permissible. That, that that the schools with strict scrutiny cannot get that much deference. That the court must conduct independent review of how race is being used. But Fisher number two seemed to go in the opposite direction. That the court would not strictly scrutinize how race was being used. If the court would defer, if the school says we need to use race in this factor to achieve a critical mass, that was sufficient. And so under the standards now, you have basically strict scrutiny 
with deference, right? Usually with strict scrutiny, the state has a burden to make their case. Now the state's burden is saying, well, trust us. And that's enough to survive strict scrutiny. In no other context is strict scrutiny this weak. Right? Usually strict scrutiny is very hard to satisfy. So in the history of the Supreme Court, which racial classifications have been upheld? Number one is Korematsu, right? In the modern era. And number two is the affirmative action cases, right? In both cases, they uphold the use of racial classifications. Okay, I think I got everything. Macy, is that helpful to you? It's extremely, thank you. Okay, my pleasure. Um, always glad to help. What questions do we have? Any questions? All right, I think I got everything I needed to. Um, definitely go back and read the case summaries of these two because I didn't have much time to talk about the facts, but the facts in the case are very significant. Um, all right, I'm going to start the minute poll now, and I'll be back here on 1230 for office hours, but thank you all so much. Have a wonderful weekend. I'll see the last batch of you for the review session.